Hi, this is the fourth screencast from chapter one, and this one's going to cover the characteristics of life. And as you can see from the screen here, that there are eight of them. And we're going to go over these in all in detail. But uh, your textbook that you use in your classroom may be different than the one that I use in mine, but what you see on this list, they're pretty much universal no matter where you uh, are studying your biology from. So uh, without further ado, let's go over this list. All right. Uh, every living thing is made up of at least one cell, and we'll go over that in more detail. All living things know how to reproduce. They're going to be able to make more of their own kind. Uh, all living things have a universal genetic code, and that would be DNA, and they're also going to use RNA to help make their proteins. Uh, all living things will go through growth and development, and later in this show we're going to go over what's the difference between growth and development. Um, all living things will obtain and use materials and energy, which basically means they're going to have to go out and get some food. All living things also know how to respond to stimuli. We'll cover that in detail. Basically, when you see something, uh, you react to it. Uh, number seven, this is one of the most uh, important concepts in biology. This is homeostasis. Basically, it's your body's way of maintaining a constant internal environment, and that's going to make the chemistry inside a cell actually work a lot better. And then finally, over time, living things as a group, not as individuals, but as a group, they will evolve through natural selection. Alright, so let's look at these all in detail. All right, all living things are made up of at least one or more cell. You can see here, all living things are made up of at least one cell. And if you're only made up of one cell, you're a unicellular organism like this, these protists over here. Here you have an amoeba um, that moved by these pseudopodia right here. Actually, if you want to know how to spell pseudopodia. Pseudopodia. False feet, that's what that means in plain English, that's an O. Uh, paramecia, and then a euglena, which is a very interesting protist. Uh, it, it can do both photosynthesis and get its own food. Right? These are all very common things that you'd find in, in pond water. So you probably have seen these at one point or another in your biology classroom. Now, organisms like uh, human beings and other uh, most other animals, they're multicellular. In fact, all animals are multicellular. And multi means many. So these are made up of many cells. Now, when you are multicellular, you have to be, you actually have to have, whoops, let's try this one right here. You have to have specialized cells. And these are cells that have special functions. So as you look over here, this is a picture of skin. And as you can see here, uh, these cells right here, the epidermis, the outer layer, they're mainly flat. They, they kind of act like shingles on, on your roof of your house. And then we have other cells down in here in what uh, under layer, which we'd call the dermis. And as you can see here, we have cells that are going to produce a hair follicle, which you know, a strand of hair. All right, so these cells down here are producing the protein keratin that will lead to this. What's going on here? Now, the sebaceous gland, uh, that produces the oil. And that keeps your skin kind of soft. Um, if you think about it, if you ever played baseball, uh, you had to put oil on your glove because your baseball glove is basically made out of skin. You need to make it soft to make it supple. And this is what the sebaceous gland does for us. Here you can see the erector pili muscle. That's this area right in here. And when this thing uh, contracts, it leads to goosebumps and makes the hair stand up. So as you can see in here, in a multicellular creature, you got all of these different cells that have become specialized. So very, very important concept. Even though it's an easy one, it's still very important. What's the wrong button? There we go. All right. The next thing is all living things need to reproduce. And there's two kinds of reproduction. Now, what you see on this slide is very important. As you can see by all the colors, make sure you know the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction. So let's start out with uh, asexual reproduction. And in asexual reproduction, you want to make sure that you remember that all the babies are genetically identical to the parent. All right? The DNA sequence in the offspring is exactly the same as those of the parent. Now, what's good about asexual reproduction? It's really, really easy to do. I mean, really, basically, all you have to do is you just have to split in half. So as you can see over here, this cell is just splitting in half. Um, this would actually be uh, mitosis over here is a type of, of division like your skin cells would do to make more skin cells. All right? All the cell does, split in half, and you notice 
these two babies are genetically identical. You can see here, big A, small A, big A, small A. The bad part with it is you don't have any genetic variety. Genetic variety is the raw material. Whoops, let's spell raw correctly. This is the raw material for evolution. Let me get caught up here. We need this genetic variety. We need to have some individuals who have special traits to be able to survive so that a species will be able to carry on. And we're going to cover this in, in two chapters in much more detail later in the school year. So as long as you just remember what I just wrote down here on your screen, then you'll be perfect. All right. Sexual reproduction is the favored version for all living things. Number one is because the offspring is genetically different. Okay. You'll notice that you and your offspring, you are slightly different than your parents genetically. Uh, you have a lot in common because half your genes came from mom and the other half came from dad, but you are special. You have a certain set of genes that's just perfect for you. Now, if you have a brother or a sister, they're going to have a set of genes that are slightly different than yours because they were also produced by sexual reproduction. Now, the pro for this one is what makes it so great. It's all that genetic variety. Genetic variety, as we see all up here again, it's the raw material for evolution. Now, what's bad about it is it's harder to do. When you had asexual reproduction, you just need one individual. Splits in half, now you got two. With sexual reproduction, you need two individuals because you're going to get half the genes from the mom and half the genes from the dad. And so what you see, like uh, this is what I used about this uh, picture here, is that in birds, you often have a lot of this sexual selection. So here's a peacock, and he's just displaying his feathers so that the peahen over here will be attracted to him. If he shakes his tail feathers in the proper format, um, she'll, she'll like it, and then they will mate. And so she'll donate her egg cells, and it's half of her genes. He'll donate a sperm cell, which has half of his genes. And there you go. You got your little baby. All right? So don't forget this stuff. You need to know the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction. All right, all living things have a universal genetic code. And this genetic code is based upon DNA. Now, the stuff in green here is real important, so make sure you remember this one. DNA contains the information for producing proteins. Proteins are used in every bit of chemistry or every chemical process that occurs inside a living thing. Um, life can't go on without proteins and you can't make your proteins unless you've got DNA. So we're going to spend tons and tons of time on this year about how DNA and proteins will work together. But just remember all living things have some DNA in them. All right. All living things will grow and develop throughout their lifespan. All right. And eventually they, they may stop developing. They may stop growing, but there was always a period of very, very rapid development and growth. So what's the difference between these two? All right? Well, growth, as you can see right here, this simply means you're getting bigger. And you typically get bigger by producing more cells. Now you do have a limited ability to make some of the cells bigger than they originally were, but that's actually limited. We're going to cover that when we get in our chapter about cells. But basically you get bigger because you are producing more cells. Okay, now development, and since most of you are teenagers that are watching this podcast, especially if you're my students, you're going through a period of development called adolescence. Now, development is a change in form and function. Typically what happens is the cells in your body are going to get some new uh, properties. They're going to be able to do new functions that they couldn't do before. And this is typically done through a process, and we talked about this earlier about specialized cells, through a process called specialization. Now this is one of my favorite pictures. Put some eyeballs on this baby. <laughs> That's a scary baby unfortunately. All right now look at the now the baby isn't six foot tall but look at how the proportions in your body change as you develop into an adult. Okay if you ever look at babies they got these giant heads. Look how big its head is compared to the size of its body. Now adults even though their head is bigger than an infant's, in proportion to their body, it's much, much smaller. Okay, You guys are probably right in around this stage right there. 
Okay, so make sure you know the difference between growth and development. That just smells like a test or quiz question. Um, you know, I might be dropping some hints for you guys. <clears throat> all right, all living things are going to obtain and use materials and energy, which basically means they're going to go out and get some food. All right, now the materials are the basic building blocks, and these are the biomolecules. Bio means life, and then molecules means molecules. Basically, atoms held together by covalent bonds. All right. Now, the four types of biomolecules are your carbohydrates, lipids, which would be fats and oils, and then the last two are uber important, proteins and nucleic acids. And we're going to be covering that in our next chapter, chapter two. So you're going to learn all about these and probably more than you ever thought you could. All right. And then finally, energy. Energy is defined as the ability to do work, and it's typically stored in chemical bonds. Everything that occurs in a living thing is done through chemical reactions. And in chemical reactions, you have bonds being broken, new bonds being made, and things are being rearranged, right? So typically when you break a bond, you release energy. Just use a big E for energy. And then when you create a bond, so we'll just say make, so you're making a chemical bond, you're storing energy. Okay. Now over here what we have in this picture, uh, this shows you the pathway of how a molecule called ATP, and ATP is how we transfer energy from one set of chemicals to another set of chemicals. So over here, you're taking in glucose, which would be sugar, and you're going to transfer the energy in glucose into this ATP molecule. Now this ATP molecule will be transferred to, in this example, a process where the amino acids are being used to build proteins. Well, you're making something, so remember you're storing energy, so you're going to use energy, and then if you actually go the reverse, you're going to release energy. All right? So we're, we're going to talk about how ATP cycles back and forth from ADP and ADP uh, in much more detail in the upcoming chapters. All right, let's brush away our writing. Let's move on to the next slide. Whoops, wrong button again. All right, six and seven, okay? All living things respond to their environment. And what you do is you will respond to a stimulus. Stimuli is plural, stimulus is singular, all right? So this is an environmental signal that causes a response, all right? So, when you smell a skunk, you typically are going to move away from that, I would hope anyway, okay? Uh, you use your five senses to pick up on the stimuli. You will see something, you'll hear something, you'll smell something, um, you'll feel it, and, and that's going to cause a response. So, remember when you were a little kid and you touched the, the top of a stove and it was hot and you moved your hand away real fast, okay? When you felt the heat, that was the stimulus, and your response was to pull your hand back, okay? Hopefully, like when you see a car coming front towards you on the street, you have a tendency to get out of the way because you saw the stimulus, the car coming towards you, and your response was to get out of the way, all right? So very, very important. Living things are always responding to their environment. The uh, environment has always given us a, a stimulus or a stimuli, all right? All living things maintain a stable internal environment. And this process is known as homeostasis. Okay, we're gonna talk about a homeostasis probably in every single chapter that you cover this year. Because maintaining a, a constant, stable environment is really important to do all these chemical reactions that make life go. All right, so if you want to do cellular respiration inside a mitochondria, you got to make sure the pH level is correct, the oxygen level is correct, the temperature is correct, et cetera, et cetera. And anytime you get outside of that range, the living thing is going to have some difficulty, and some of that times that difficulty can lead to death. All right, so once again, this is a, you know this is our first chapter. We're just introducing some concepts. We're going to go over all these much more detail later in the school year, and some of them actually in the next chapter. All right, and our final characteristics of life is taken as a group, all living things will evolve. All right, now evolution will occur through a process of natural selection. Remember we talked about sexual uh, reproduction earlier in the screencast? 
Sexual reproduction produces a population of individuals that has slightly different genetic codes. In other words, they're also going to have slightly different traits. Now, nature is going to select individuals who have the good traits, and those individuals will be allowed to reproduce more often and pass their traits on to the next generation. And that is how evolution occurs. Now, towards the uh, in the second semester, we're going to go over evolution in much more detail. Uh, chapters 14, 15, somewhere in that ballpark. All right, but I want you to remember that evolution uh, will occur through a process called natural selection. Nature selects which individuals get to pass their genes on to the next generation. Now, an individual cannot evolve because they're given whatever genes they were given at birth, and it's up to that individual or nature to select if those genes are good enough for that individual. Now, if that individual is lucky enough to have the good genes, then it will be able to pass those good genes on to the next generation, and the species as a whole should benefit from these special um, genes. All right, so let's look down here at this graphic. Uh, this is by a bacterium called H. pylori, uh, and this is actually the um, it's actually a bacterium that leads to a lot of stomach ulcers. Okay, now uh, one of the things that we know about evolution is um, we're seeing it in bacteria almost right before our eyes because of the overuse of antibiotics. So as you can see here, within a population of this bacteria, some of them are normal, but occasionally you get one or two is just a mutant. They got a weird gene. And sometimes this gene gives them a resistance to antibiotics. So under normal ones, if you give them an antibiotic, they'll die. But the mutant, he's not affected by this antibiotic at all. And so what happens is these guys are dead, these survive, they reproduce more often, and now our entire population of H. pylori is resistant to antibiotics. And that's evolution in a nutshell. It's change over time through a process of natural selection. Nature selected that this guy was better than this one, and so our population evolved more and more antibiotic resistance. All right, uh, that's going to wrap up this screencast. Uh, once again, make sure you keep it up on your assignments, and don't forget to check back on this channel so you can keep up and learn some new things in biology. Until next time, see you later.